we have a storage of, of healthy fat in our body called brown fat, which is literally brown under the microscope because it's rich with mitochondria. It's not the blubbery fat that um, people generally want to have less of. It's a, a deep tissue fat. Uh, it's really healthy. You tend to lose it over time unless you do cold exposure. Deliberate cold exposure is one way to enrich the amount of brown fat. You get a, a stronger furnace. And there's some wonderful science on this uh, published recently in Cell, uh, Cell Reports Medicine by Susanna Soberg. It's really amazing work. What, what they showed is that 11 minutes a week divided up into a couple sessions of two to three minutes of deliberate cold exposure increases the density of brown fat in adults and allows them to feel more comfortable in cold temperatures when they're just walking around. But also when they put themselves into this deliberate cold, and I'll talk about how cold in a moment, that then they achieve much bigger increases in core uh, resting metabolism, um, improvements in blood lipid, uh, blood lipid and, and insulin management profiles. And there's some other positive effects like improved mental resilience. So a lot of positive effects. So a lot of people say, okay, do I need to get into an ice bath? No, you need to get uncomfortably cold for 11 minutes a week. That could be done with a cold shower. That could be done by getting into an ice bath. That could be done by getting into the ocean. That could be done by getting into a lake. That could be, um, it is not important how you get cold. How cold depends. And people always say, I want to give me a number. Well, what's uncomfortable to you is not going to be uncomfortable to me and vice versa. So uncomfortably cold. And then the, the key thing is that it needs to be safe. You're going to try and get into chilly water that you want to get out, but you can calm yourself and stay in for that period of two to three minutes. There's one study that was done having people submerge themselves in water of about 60 degrees, which is not particularly cold, 60 degrees Fahrenheit but they did it for 45 minutes. So it could also be being in kind of, you know, when you get into a pool and it's not quite warm enough, it could be that, but you stay in longer. But for 11 minutes, it should be pretty uncomfortable. You want to get out. So I think you get that 11 minutes per week and that sets you up for this effect. And it should be divided across multiple sessions, but it could be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then you have four days off. It could be Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It doesn't really matter. Now there are other reasons to do cold exposure. What happens when you get into cold? A couple of things, you vasoconstrict and there's a rebound vasodilation, so you're getting per better perfusion and blood flow. Biggest effect is a big increase, 2.5x increase in dopamine that lasts for several hours. Uh, you know, it's a significant increase. You feel mentally clear, you feel alert. It increases metabolism for the reasons we discussed before. And then there's the process of getting into this cold water when you didn't want to. And that is overriding limbic friction. That's that top-down control. So you build resilience. There are other effects too. Um, for instance, if you want to enhance fat loss and lipolysis, it does seem like activating shiver is key because when you shiver, the muscles release a molecule called succinate. Succinate then goes and activates the brown fat. So you get a further increase in metabolism. One of the best things you can do is get into the cold source, whatever it happens to be. If you don't shiver while you're in there, get out, but don't dry off and just stand there, you'll start to shiver pretty quickly as it starts to evaporate off you. There's sauna. So sauna or hot shower or um, or hot bath. I mean, there's a variety of different um, ways to get the heat up. You need to be really careful with heat because the brain can cook. You need to approach heat gradually. But when you get into the heat, your heart starts to beat faster. It's uncomfortable. So I'm a big fan of traditional sauna. Um, wet or dry sauna, but not. I'm not a big fan of infrared sauna. Most of the time they don't get hot enough. But really what you want to do is get into uncomfortable but safe heat environment. And you get vessel dilation and capillary dilation. You get better perfusion. Um, you get better at sweating, which is good, actually, to learn how to off, offload heat. There's a metabolic increase. It's work to cool yourself off when um, metabolic work to cool yourself off when you're in the heat. You get activation of heat shock proteins. Um, Generally, there's a rebound cooling when you get out that can help you transition to sleep. I do think if you're going to do cold exposure to do it in the early part of the day, because it tends to be very stimulating, whereas heat can be done later in the day. Now, let's say you're going to do contrast therapies. So you're going to go cold, heat, cold, heat. doesn't matter with what you start with. I like to do heat first, then cold. But this morning we were in the ocean, then went to the sauna. It doesn't matter. But if you're going to go back and forth, it's pretty clear that you, if your goal is metabolic increase, fat loss, et cetera, then you want to finish with cold. And so you might go cold, heat, cold, heat, cold, and you finish with cold and then you have to, because then you have to heat yourself up naturally using your own endogenous mechanisms. And that itself 
has a big metabolic demand. If I'm going to do sauna in the evening, then I don't have, a, I'll just get in the sauna, get out and kind of cool off. Maybe take a warmish shower, a cool shower, and then get into bed. No big deal. But I'm not gonna do an ice bath right before bed. Because generally to fall asleep, you need a one to three degree drop in temperature. And you would say, well, getting in the sauna should heat my body up. No, but when you get out, you have a rebound cooling. Maybe we'll save a life or two here. Let's say you're overheating on a really hot day. You've gone for a run and you know someone's hyperthermic. You would think, oh, put cold, wet towels over their body. Well, your body has a thermostat in the brain called the medial preoptic hypothalamus. If you put a bunch of cold towels on the exterior of your body, it's like putting an ice pack on the thermostat. What happens? You're going to heat up. A lot of people die that way. So the better thing to do is to cool off the palms of your hands, your upper face, and the bottoms of your feet because those are the portals for, for heat loss. A couple of things about the cold that might be useful. If your goal in strength training is hypertrophy or strength, um, in resistance training, I should say, is hypertrophy or your strength, don't do immersion cold therapy, meaning putting your body into any kind of cold environment, very cold environment, within the four hours after that training because you want the inflammation as a stimulus for muscle growth and adaptation. If your goal is to recover quickly, like you're gonna race the next day or something, then get right into the cold or you're gonna compete. So it depends on what your goal is. One of the, the limiting factors on athletic performance of all kinds, endurance and strength, is heating up of the muscle tissue because as it heats up, pyruvate kinase can't do its action of conversion to ATP and this kind of thing. So if you're gonna go out for a long run, you wanna take a cool shower beforehand or get into the ice bath beforehand because it will lower your core body temperature and you'll be primed for more for better performance. It mentioned that the threshold for sauna that's, that kind of emerges from the literature is about 57 minutes per week. You could do that in one session. You'd wanna get out every 20 minutes or so. Um, there's also big increases in growth hormone from sauna. Um, growth hormone is involved in tissue repair and protein synthesis and metabolism, not just for growing muscles, but for remaining healthy in a number of ways. And it tends to, it definitely that's a hormone that definitely is reduced as we age. So getting into the, a warm environment for 20 minutes and then getting out for a few minutes and cooling off, ice bath or no, or cold environment or no, but just standing next to it and then getting back in, doing that for about 57 minutes a week total, minimum, it can be very effective. People ask, well, will hot showers work as well? Maybe, but there just haven't been a lot of studies. Um, people say, well, I don't have access to a sauna. There are ways you could do this. I mean, the, you could use the wrestler's approach, which is pretty masochistic, but you can you know, wear double hoodie, double sweats and go out for a run that you'll warm up. Um, you know, you gotta be careful about hyperthermia, but th there are a lot of ways to, to, uh, to do this. But um, I try and get into the sauna for an hour a week total, maybe two half hour sessions. Uh, I try and get into the cold two or three times per week, two or three minutes per. It's a game changer. I mean, it will, it will make you feel much better. You will metabolize food energy much better. You, you'll just feel better. You get that big dopamine kick from the, from the cold and uh, it's powerful. So one thing that's good is if you can get a cold, just a cold bath, cold water bath, followed by a hot shower, that's a great step forward. Or hot shower followed by cold water bath if you really wanna prime the metabolism thing. So that's an at-home thing that most people can do.